to all the dear participants that are present here. I am Shamimi and I will be your MC for today. I hope everyone is doing well and is in good health. First of all, on behalf of Fighter Pioneers, I would like to thank everyone here for supporting our event today. We had received an overwhelming response for this event after we had opened the registration. Thank you very much for your support. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce to you our speaker, Mr. Theo Weijin. Mr. Theo Weijin graduated with a Bachelor of Chemical Engineering from University Malaya. He is currently a Technical Services Engineer at Lean Gas Singapore. Currently, he is working on productivity, improvement and digitalization projects. Previously, he worked as Process Engineer and Project Manager. His job scopes include coding and automating mass and energy balance calculations for thermal oxidizers and incineration plants. Mr. Teo writes codes and serves as a community teaching assistant, CTA, for EDX principles of manufacturing MicroMaster, a free open online course by MIT. Previously, Mr. Teo was part of UNICHAT and has received numerous awards, including the Institution of Engineers IEM Awards, UM Excellent Student Award, and Muhammad Zaki Sulaiman Memorial Award, including Award in Nurses. Allow me to mention several reminders before we proceed to the webinar. Kindly mute your microphone while the webinar is ongoing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask questions only by typing the questions through Mentimeter by visiting the Mentimeter website and type in the code 95767583 or by clicking the link provided in the chat box. The questions will be answered during the Q&A session later. Without further ado, I pass the floor to Mr. Theo Weijin to start the talk with the topic Python and Data Analytics. Please welcome. All right, thank you, uh, Naoshami, for the introduction and welcome to today's Python and Data Analytics. So today will be a very fast-paced sort of uh, touch and go application on how we can use um, Python in a data analytics setting. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so that's me, Weijin, and nice to meet everyone here. So uh, I'll outline about a little bit of myself, uh, common myths about Python, basic syntax, and some hands-on examples with a simple data analytics workflow that I I'm going to demonstrate to you. So hi, so uh, I'm Weijin. I'm a coffee enthusiast, part-time engineer, as I like to call myself. And I think I've, I will not repeat this as MC has uh, spoken about most of them. And what do I do now? Usually I just post on LinkedIn about some things about programming and Excel and uh, some tips and tricks that can help you once in a while. So before we get started with Python in data analytics, right? It's best to actually know what is data analytics in the first place. Because if you don't know something, how can we like actually do it properly, right? So data analytics, the simplest definition I could find is the science of analyzing raw data to make conclusions. So it's that simple. Just analyze data, take data, analyze data, make conclusions, and then we get some value out of the data. So data analytics, right, is a part of data science. And data science is a sort of the big, big umbrella term for a group of fields that we call the DS space, the data science space. And under data science, we have data analytics, we have data visualization, we have AI, machine learning, deep learning, and, and all the other terms that you usually hear about uh, nowadays. So the issue with all these terms is, is that many people don't use them properly. So the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist would be that a data analyst will identify, visualize, and present trends, which is what we are doing today. Whereas the data scientist actually designs and constructs the new processes for data modeling and production, which is not what we are going to do today, but today we are going to be a data analyst 
And the reason why we want to look at the trends in the data is because we want to make conclusions from the data. With the trends, we know what are the conclusions that we can make from the data. So it's actually this simple. If uh, we don't consider all the other jargon that is present in the uh, data science space. So data analytics in analogy. Imagine data as a bunch of Lego blocks. First, we can sort them by color. We can arrange them in order, which is the smaller, which is the tallest. We can present them visually, that means we arrange them nicely, explain the story, and then we can turn the data into some useful, actionable uh, intelligence or insights that we can gain from the data. So data science process, right? There are many, many variants of the data science process, but this is the one that I found that could be the easiest to understand uh, if you are using an AI application. So first we collect data. Obviously we collect data and this data might not be perfect. It might be missing some things. It might have some nonsense in it. There might be some noise. There might be some wrong information. We have to clean it. After we clean that, we start to have a look at the data. So that's what we call exploratory data analysis, which is that means that you roughly plot some graphs, you look at the trends roughly to see what is uh, the main underlying information that we want from the data. And then we proceed to the AI stage. If uh, this is an AI application, first you build the model, that's the model, and then you deploy the model. So these are the domain of machine learning engineers, which means that uh, they are the ones that specialize in machine learning applications in AI. So today we are not going to be that, but we are going to learn a little bit about how we can apply this kind of uh, AI models in our uh, daily life. All right, so, so uh, the standard common data analytics workflow will be first to collect data. In the term is called data ingestion, but you could just call it data collection. So you can collect it by asking people to fill in forms, uh, having Excel data that you already have. You can take data from websites. For example, I take mm -hmm. some data from the Wikipedia page uh, of this. Sorry. For example, we take the data from the Wikipedia page of some, uh, some company, or we take data from Facebook, Google, and so on. And that will be done by using the REST API, which is a very common way of taking data from websites, but it's not in the scope of discussion today. So today I'm going to just assume that we have uh, ready-made data, right? That we can, uh, we can just use. The next step will be data cleansing and transformation, which means that we look at the data, we see what's wrong, what's missing, we fix them, then only we send the data to the next step. So the first thing to do is what we call exploratory data analysis, which means that uh, you roughly look at the data or overall picture. Then you do cleaning and transforming. There are many names for this process. Some people call it wrangling, some people call it munging, some people call it uh, remediation. So these are all names for the same process. After that, if the data is too complex, we do what is called dimensionality reduction, which is actually optional. So we won't do it this time. So dimensionality reduction means that some data is actually redundant. For example, I in the data, there's a column asking someone for their IC number. The next column is their date of birth. The next column is their year of birth. And the next column is their age. So basically, IC number and date of birth can be simplified to one column because they have the same data in it. And then we can eliminate the year of birth column. We can eliminate the age column because we can calculate that from the date of birth. So this is how sometimes we have to do to reduce the workload of any machine learning application, especially when it comes to AI, because if you have a lot of columns, it's going to take a very long time to train your AI to do whatever you want. And next we have a uh, data analysis. So this is a real like bigger portion of the time. However, uh, most of the time in any data analytics workflow is actually here. This actually spends most of the time. And data analysis actually takes up only like 20% of the time. Most of the time is actually spent getting it, cleaning it, transforming it to the way it wants, and then uh, reducing whatever the information that is in there. So data analysis is 
the most difficult part, but least time consuming part. So if that doesn't make sense to you, we have to understand that in this world, people collect data via various means, sometimes via means that it's not suitable for you. So a lot of time is actually spent preparing the data for the analysis. So what we can do in data analysis is we can do statistical analysis, just calculate mean, median, mode, and so on. You can fit them into an ML algorithm, machine learning algorithm. So the most common ML algorithms, which I will go uh, more into detail later, uh, something like classification, regression, neural networks, etc. So I will, I will go into detail later on what, what they mean and what they are. Finally, when we have finally analyzed the data, right, we have to present the findings in a way that people can uh, understand, right? even non-technical people can understand. So data analysis should not, should not be just something that only you yourself understand. So there are various visualizations that can be used, including plots, charts, scatter plots, and heat maps, etc. So I am sure you know what are charts, scatter plots. Heat maps is something new. So I'm just going to show you later on how heat map looks like. Okay. So talking about all these data analytics, uh, the data analysis process, all the steps, right? How how do we do it, right? We have to find a we have to like have a way to actually do every step. So if you look at the most common programming languages, Python is far ahead in the most popular programming languages. One of the reasons being that it is very easy to learn. And the second reason being that of all the steps that I just shown in the previous slide, Python can do all of them. Uh, well, except data collection, because that will has, have to be done manually. But the rest of the steps can be done in Python. And that is one of the reasons why Python is very popular. Also the fact that it's very easy to learn. So what is Python, right? The programming language. So the Python language was first released in 1990. It's an open source language. It's named after a comedy show called Monty Python, which is a British comedy show that I guess people nowadays don't, don't watch anyway. It's in the 1960s. And the current version is 3.x, which is uh, the current version is but yesterday, the latest version is 3.9.13, but the, the versions can change rapidly. So if you watch this in a few, a few more days, it might not be 13 anymore. Although I say 3.x because like, as long as it's Python 3, it's quite similar uh, throughout the versions. You code Python, we are what we call an integrated development environment. So this is basically where you type a code. And for the more advanced people out there, Python is an object-oriented programming language, which means that you code, you can code objects which fall under certain classes. You can have class, subclasses, inheritance, and so on. But this is something that I will not, uh, I will not go into today. Although we are going to use it in our examples. So the most common Python ID in use is actually a uh, spider for PC or laptop-based applications. So it's actually part of Anaconda. Anaconda is a whole package which includes other items, but ID itself is called Spider. If you don't want to use something on your laptop, you can go for an online ID, which is very common nowadays. There are a lot of com online IDs. One of the one I like most is wrapper.it, which I will post a link in the chat in a while. And another one you could try is what we call Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks is a way for you to run code piece by piece. And that makes it easy to understand because uh, you can actually segment your code in pieces, run this part, see what happens, run this part, see what happens, and so on. Okay, so this is the basics of Python. So the basics of Python that we will cover today are, first, we will cover how to set up data. You want to use data, you have to input that data into Python. Secondly, how to manipulate data. So you need some way to manipulate the data that we just put in. Thirdly, how to store data. So once you have manipulated the data, we have to put it somewhere. So that's containers. Or how to import libraries. So Python has a lot of like third-party libraries that has a lot of useful functions. So you don't have to write the functions themselves. So how do we do that? This is the fourth. Fifth is how to analyze data with a simple uh, ML algorithm. 
So you can do very simple analysis on the data. And the last is how to visualize data. That means after we have analyzed the data, how do we show it to the public? All right. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a while. And I'm just going to show you the three different IDs that we are going to use so that uh, you can choose which one you want, right? So I'm just going to drop the link here. And you can have a look in the chat. All right, so the first I'm going to show is uh, Anaconda. So Anaconda is uh, an ID that requires installation. So if you can, you can, Anaconda is probably the most powerful of all the three IDs. So you can, it's best that you can install it. It's around 600 megabyte download. It can take some time for, if you don't have a fast internet connection. And you can, uh, but you can use it for a lot of things. And it's very powerful, has everything in it that uh, you want. So it's like 600 megabyte download. The second ID I'm going to show you is called wrapper.it. So wrapper.it is basically just an online ID that you can, uh, let me see if I open it. So what you can do with this is you can log in with your Google account. Just log in with your Google account, then you can start using it. There's no hassle in it, no installation required, and so on. So just give it a name. Yes. Uh, this is quite interesting, for example. Then you can uh, just create it. Then you will get the uh, ID view. So this is how it will look like if you choose to use Wepper. And the third way to do it will be, uh, the third ID I'm going to show is to use Jupyter Lab. So Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Jupyter Lab is the owner of Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks is basically a way for you to Keep a journal basically of what you're doing. Then you can run bits of code, um, see the, the results, run again, see the results, run again, see the results. So it's quite good for uh, people who want to learn Python from scratch. Okay, so this is a Jupyter Lab window. You just have to click on. Uh, notebook, click on this, and then it opens a new notebook for you, which, is some, which has nothing on it. Okay, so I'm just going to stick with this for a while and Okay, so I'm just going to show you using one of them, so we don't get confused with too many different softwares to. Alright, so I'm just going to show you one of them, so that you won't get very confused. Like there are like many different versions of uh, of uh, IDEs that you want. So I'm just going to stick with the last one. Okay. So the first thing, okay, so can you guys hear me? Just to confirm before I move forward. Yes. We can hear you. Okay, so, okay thanks, uh, Samimi. Right. 
So the first thing we are going to go through right, is how do we input the data in Python? So that's variables, right? So let me, I'm just going to show you in the uh in our my Jupyter lab environment how we do that. Okay, so I have my Firefox up in my Jupyter lab environment. So if you are using a web book, you type everything on the black color console. All right, you, have, you type everything on the black color console. If you're using Jupyter, you type inside these cells that you can create, you can add new cells, then you can type in inside of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just zoom in a little. And how, how I use Jupyter notebooks is that you type in some code here. So let's say I just type x equals to two. And then I run the cell by typing shift enter. You see a number, which means that the cell has successfully run. And then the next cell, you will then be able to access the previous cell. So for number print x to number two underneath each other cell. So this, this is how the Jupyter notebook environment works. So the first thing first, all right, there are many different types of variables in Python. So I'm just going to go through like some theory about the variables for you guys that like, get prepared on the environment. And you can see that there are a few variables in Python. The first will be a string variable, which is basically text, uh, like hello world or full bar, which is sort of a computer science joke. I'm not sure why, but they like to use full bar as an example. A symbol is also a string. An empty space, which you do by typing space bar, is also a string. And next you have integers. So integers can be positive, negative, or zero. And integers have no decimal points. So that's an integer. So Boolean is basically true or false. So if it, for numbers that are not integers, we have what we call a floating point number, which is a number that has uh, decimal points, right? And then we can have complex numbers as well if you are doing scientific calculations. But the difference in Python is that the calculations use J as the complex uh, number, not I. So you have to use J as, a, as your number. And it's also non-type variable, which usually happens if you forget to define the variable. Then it will show up as non-type. And finally, there are quite a few different types of uh, container variables, which are under the class of collection. So this will we'll go through later. So here there's a little bit of object-oriented programming in here that this term class refers to a, a specific type of variable. So that means that all variables of the same class, for example, all strings will have a certain fixed properties. So this is the object-oriented programming concept because that each object right, you create will be a member of each class. But the class definitions are something that you cannot change. So it's just, you can create new swings, but you cannot change the definition. Okay, so let's go back to our ID. And then we can go on from here. Okay, so I'm just going to delete everything. So the, the first phase to click on kernel, we start kernel and clear all our puts. So this will cause all the uh, whatever you type, all the results will just disappear. But when you type, you still mean, right? So let's start to define some variables. So let's define x equals one. So equal sign is an assignment variable. You assign something to a variable name. The variable name is x. The value of the variable is one. So you want this cell by pressing shift enter. And then Python will remember x is equal to one. And then we can do something on it. So I can find out what is the variable type by typing type open bracket the variable name. So it shows that the x variable is of type int, which means that it's an integer. So we can come up with another variable. Let's say y equals 2.5. And then I can just type uh, type y. And you get a float integer, a float variable. So that means that 2.5 is the floating point number. You can also have uh, a equals to some people's name, let's say handle, right? So this will be a string variable. 
But for string variable, you must always enclose them in either single or double quotation marks. So Python, for Python, it doesn't matter which one you use, but it must be, how to say, it must be uh, equal. So whatever, if you start with single, the back must be also a single quotation mark. And then if uh, you have an empty space, it's also considered a string variable. And if we have, let's say, a Boolean variable. So Boolean variable, have to, but we have to differentiate, right? If you put the word true inside quotation marks, it becomes actually a string, not the Boolean variable type. That means that any operation that requires Boolean variable logic will not work. So you have to be careful. Same as well with numbers. So let's say if I, let's say if I uh, define this number in uh, quotation marks, it will also be saved as a string, which means that any calculations using this number will not work. Right. So that's how uh, the variable definition works. And it's quite important to be exactly right in what you want to do to ensure that you have the correct variable. So if we try, I try to uh, call the type of a variable that doesn't exist, you will get a name error. Name F is not defined. So Python is better than some other languages in the sense that Python does give you very good error messages. So it's quite obvious that the reason this error happens is because I don't have F as a variable. So if I start defining F as uh, zero, let's say, I can use again. All right. So that's all basically for variables. Very simple, nothing much to do yet. Let's go to the second point for today, which is the operators. Then we can finally do something to these variables, and that will be more interesting. Right. So it comes to the operators page here. And so operators are basically how we manipulate uh, variables, right? So we can do maps on them, plus minus, multiply dy. So the forward slash sign is for dy. You can do exponent on them. The exponent sign in Python is not, it's this, uh, it's actually two asterisks. So this is exponent sign. And you can also do modulus and integer division. Integer division means divide and give you the value without the remainder. The modulus gives you the remainder. So let's say I have seven divided by three. Uh, let's say seven divided by two. So you actually get three remainder one. So this is the integer division part of the answer. This is the modulus part of the answer. So the Modulus method is not really useful to calculate divisions because like, we are not like in primary school anymore. But it's very useful to know whether a number is odd or even. Because if the number is odd, if you modulus by two, you always get zero. So that's sort of a test for whether a number is odd or even. Assignment variable, assignment operator, which means that I assign something to a variable. But if I want to compare a variable, it's actually double equal sign. I want to compare whether something is equal to something else. That's a double equal sign. And then we have not equal to, which is a exclamation mark and equal. We can have less than, more than, uh, less than or equal to, and more than or equal to. And then we have the Boolean operators, n or all. And then we have the negation operator, not. Right? So let's show you a little bit here on uh, my ID on how to do that, on how to use all these uh, operators. Okay, so I'm just going to continue reading this uh, notebook. So let's try something like x equals to 2. Enter, y equals to 3. So when I define a new variable using an existing name, because I already, already use x equals to 1, it will just overwrite the old variable. So x is now 2. So I can just type in x plus y. I get 5. It's actually right. 
so I can find like x exponential y. You get it? You can have a x integer division by two. You get one. X modulus mm -hmm. by two. You get zero. So this shows that this is a. It shows that this is a even number. So if I take y and then uh, modulus by two, I get one. So basically, this is basically. I'm sorry, the Mr. Tio. Even number test. Yeah. Uh, I we cannot see your screen. Oh, oh wow! Sorry, I misclicked the uh, stop sharing button. Okay, okay we so can see now. Okay, thanks. So I'll just do these two again for your benefit. Okay, so we have done like some simple mathematics. So I'm just going to show you how we do the modulus, which is x. Uh, first we do integer division, which is double slash and then two. This will give you the uh, integer division. And then you can do the modulus by using the percent sign. And this will give you zero, which is a remainder. If I take y and then y is three, by the way. Sorry, let me just go to two. So you get one. So this is basically the test for the odd and even number. Because any any odd or even number you always return in this form. So odd, uh, even number you have zero as answer. Odd number you have one. So this is the odd and even number test. And then we can also compare things like, for example, if I type in x equals to 2, it assigns a value 2 to x, right? But if I type in x double equal to 2, it does a comparison. So actually, I'm asking it whether x is equal to 2 or not. So the answer is 2. So I can, can I put this way? x equal to 3, the answer is false. Is x not equal to 3, the answer is 2. And you can go on and on. Then we also do comparisons. Uh, y greater than 4, false y less than or equal to 3, true. And we can also do n and all. So for example, I can do some logic operations. x uh, not equal to 3. And y less than or equal to 3. They get true. The reason being that this is not true. So these are some of the operators that we can do. Right? And then we can also use not, not y. That's not equal to three, you get four. So not necessarily give the opposite answer of the what level that's behind it. So these are some of the basic operators that are existing in Python. And we can now move on to a little bit about the logic for uh, true and false statements. So operator n will only be true if all are true, false otherwise. So on the right, there are some examples on how, when it will be true. Same with all, right? So all is false if all curses are false, otherwise true. So on the right side, you can see the difference. So you can see the difference is only here. The difference is only here when they have different answers. So here, x is equal to 2. So x compared to 1 will be false. y compared to 1 will be true. And this differentiates using either or or n. Right? So n will only be true when both of them are true. Whereas for all, because this one right is true, the answer is true. So you do have to be careful on whether you put n or all. Right? So let's move on to what we call containers, also called collections, the Python class name. There are four major types of collections, and collections are comprehension expressions. So let's not go into what is comprehension expressions just yet, but let's see what are collections first. Okay, so let's go to this one. Right? Okay, so let's define a simple collection. So I'll just call my collection tuple uh, tup equals to bracket one, two, three. Oh, nothing happens. Okay, so let's print that. So print would you actually tell you uh, what is in the tuple. So this is the first type of collection known as a tuple. The second type of collection is called a list. 
That's for the LS. But this is defined by square brackets. So printing it out shows you the contents. And then it tells you that this is a list, list type uh, object. Okay, as expected, right? because we define it as a list. So if I try to print out, uh, let's give the type of py qb, this is a tuple. From here, it looks like there's no difference, but later on, you will see the differences. Sir. The third is called a set. So a set is defined as, I will just call it uh, set one. A set is defined by using curly brackets, which is shift square bracket. One, two, three, four. And then I can print out the set. And then I can give the type of the set. And the last is what we call a dictionary. So dictionary in Python is very different from what you think a dictionary looks like in real life. A dictionary consists of what we call key value pairs. So we need a key and a value, a second key and a second value. So this is a dictionary. So when I type in uh, type dict, I get the dictionary type, variable type. Then when I print the dictionary, it shows in this way. Okay, so let's see how we can play around with these containers. Okay, now we see the differences between the four different containers. The first is a tuple, tuple with the normal brackets. A tuple is immutable. That means once you have defined it, you cannot change it. They press that. The second is the list. The list is defined using square brackets. And the list is mutable. So I can change uh, uh, the elements inside a list. I can change the elements inside a list. The third is the set, which is of curly brackets. The difference between the set is that it is unordered. That means an item does not remember the order in which the items are saved. So that means that when I have a set of 10,000 values, for example, the values are to be kept in random order. So why you, would you use a set? Because if you don't need to keep the order, a set can run very fast. It's very, very well uh, performance-wise compared to a tuple or this. Then finally, we have a dictionary. The dictionary has a key and the value, key and the value. So you use the key to refer to the value. So that's how a dictionary works. So let's check one by one these uh, continuous uh, properties, like in a real situation. Okay, so we are back here. So let's start with the easiest, uh, easiest container, which is the list. Okay, so now let's print out the list again, which I call LIS just now. Let's say I want to change this second item to one. Can I do that? Yes, I can do that by using square records, typing one, which is the second item. Item counts items from zero. So this is item number zero. This is item number one. And then I just change it to one. But when I print out this again, item, the second item has changed to one. So that's how I individually change the item inside a list. Let's call our tuple. Our tuple friend here. And let's change second item in the tuple to one. You get a third error. Tuple object does not support item assignment. You cannot assign anything. You cannot change anything inside the tuple once it's already, uh, once it's already defined. So that is a uh, tuple. I'm sorry, Mr. Teo, to interrupt again, but we cannot see the screen. But we cannot see the screen. 
Oh, okay, sorry. Mm, can you see now? Yes, we so can I keep see. I clicking the stop sharing button. <laughs> okay, let me do that again. So you, you change the item in the list by using square brackets and typing the number of the object, which is what we call the index of the object, but the index counts from zero. So the first item in the list is zero, one, two, three. So let's say I want to change the first item in the list to two. So this is how I'm going to do it. Assign the value to, to list item number zero. I press a quick enter. I do that. The first item has changed to, the second item has, I've already changed to one just now. But if I try to do that with a tuple, can't because the tuple object does not support item assignment because the tuple cannot be changed once you have defined. Right? How about set? So let's call the set that I just defined just now. Okay. Can I change the item set? The, let's say change the first item to. The answer is also no. The reason is that uh, item does not remember order. So it doesn't know which one is actually item zero. So that, that's, that's why you cannot assign something to a set number. And then we have a dictionary. So let's call it our dictionary that we defined just now. So this is a dictionary. The dictionary has two parts. The first part is called the keys, which I can summon by typing dot keys open close bracket. The keys here are hello and empty says this is a keys. The reason being these two is because I will see I define them as A and B. And on top, I have already defined A as hello and B as empty space. So that's why it turns out that like these are the keys. And then the second part of the dictionary is the values, which I can also show by typing top values, open close bracket. So this is the values, one and two. So when I want to call something from, from a list or tuple, right? Uh, let's use a tuple. When I want to call something, I, I type in the, the record and then the index of the item. So it shows one in the tuple. For dictionary, we don't type the index. We type in the key, the name of the key. So that's how you summon something from dictionary. So sometimes you need to assign things in a way that is not Number right? So a dictionary is a way to go. So that is the differences between the four main container types. You have to be careful because uh, if you use the wrong container type, you might not get the uh, correct result that you want. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. Okay, so we have gone through the four main containers and we have gone through like most of the items. There's one, there's one term that I have not gone through here, which is sliceable. And what exactly is sliceable? So slicing in Python is basically allows us to take out a subset from a sliceable object, such as strings, tuples, and lists. So I'm just going to demonstrate to you how to do this start and step thingy. Right? Is easier with that way. Okay, so you have this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thanks. So let's use our list as an example. Huh? So you slice the list by typing these square brackets. You must have one starting and one ending. This is the minimum. Oops, sorry, it should be semicolon. So list zero two means slice starting from first item to the second item, not including two. So this is inclusive of zero. This is not inclusive of two. So you get the first two items. If I change this to three, I get uh, I get uh, three items. When I leave it blank, I get everything. 
if I leave this blank, I can everything. Right? So this is a slicing uh, method. So let's win zero again. Let's go to the end. So I'll leave it blank. But I put in a third input. This is called the step, which is actually optional. You can leave it away. When I put it as one, it, it outputs everything the same thing. If I put it as two, it jumps one step. So if I compare with the original list that we should have here, it outputs item two, it jumps over one, it outputs item three, it jumps over four. So that is how slicing works. And why you want to do slicing is simply you want to make a copy. So I want to make list two a copy of list one. I will just slice with nothing inside. This means take everything. So when I put in list two, exactly the same as list one. I can also assign a new list to a slice one. So let's say list three is equal to list one, zero to three. In list three. Okay. First three item. And then if I now change uh, item to let's say four, it does not change the other list. The, the list three maintains the same at the same time, at the time that I slice the list out. So sometimes we want to make a copy, we want to change something on it. It's, slicing is a good way to like uh, maintain a copy of a list. So that's how slicing works. And slicing also works with, uh, with strings. Let's say I have a, I have a word, hello. I can slice zero to three. It will output the first three letters of the word of the string. So slicing also works with strings as well. Okay. And the last thing I want to show you is what we call comprehension expressions. Let's say I want to uh, generate a list of one, two, three, four, five. So I can just type out like this way. What happens if I want to generate a list that has 1,000 numbers? I cannot type from one, two, three, to 1,000. It would take forever. So what we can do is to use a comprehension expression in this way. A sample you have i for i in range zero hundred plus this. So this is a comprehension comprehension expression. So this is actually a, a for loop inside the uh inside the list. In normal, if we do it normal way, we have to write a function. But Python supports this kind of shortcuts where I can have this function directly inside the list. So when I print out y as a number zero to ninety nine. The, the range here follows the same rules as slicing. So zero is included, 100 is excluded, so until 99. So how, that's how we use comprehension expressions, right? And this is what you call a comprehension expression. So I just write it down here. And this is a comment symbol. So whatever after that is not going to be read by Python. Okay, so let me just go back. To the slides here. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast, but uh, it's still a lot to go on. Eh? Okay, so I've shown you the basics of Python. So do we need to like code everything in by ourselves? And so? The answer is no, because there are a lot of ready-made tools in Python that we can use. For example, we have uh, random, which generates like random numbers. We have NumPy, SciPy, which is used in like scientific calculations. We have NDAS, which is used in data analytics, which we'll use later. We have Matplotlib and Seaborn, which are used to create graphs. Seaborn is an easier version. We have Folium, which is for uh, geospatial visualization. For example, you want to create an app that allows you to take something from Google Maps, then you will use Folium. And finally, the last is sklearn, which is for machine learning algorithm. So we are going to look at pandas, seaborn, and sklearn uh, today. So when using pandas, there's a new type of container that we have to 
get into the container is called a data frame. So data frame is basically a table in Excel or Python, uh, in Word or Excel, but in Python. So it's also mutable, it's indexable, it's sliceable, right? And you can create new data frames by inserting columns one by one, uploading a CSV file. A CSV file is a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet right, that you can save as Excel. In Excel, uh, if you have Excel, you can save as this format, then you can upload. Or you can convert from an existing dictionary. So this example on the right is how we convert an existing dictionary into a data frame. So data frames are useful in tools for machine learning algorithms and data visualization. So that's why I'm showing you this uh, data frame today because we need to use it for our uh, analysis and visualization. So let's create a data frame. Hmm. Let's create a data frame. Okay, so we have, uh, we are back here. And if you see whatever that we just shown here, right? Print this, uh, print people, print, print. These are all containers and information, but they are not tables. I want a table to store information in rows and columns. So I cannot do that in Python. I will have to do that by importing the pandas library. So you do that by typing import pandas. I have no idea who named it pandas, maybe this person like pandas or something. So that's how we import the pandas library. But because if you import the library, when we need to call in any function that's in this library, you have to keep typing the name again and again. Pandas dot something, pandas dot something. So I thought allows you for a shortcut. I think the word SPD. Import pandas as PD. So from now onwards, we just type PD to represent pandas. So you run this code. Take some time because this is an external library, it will download from the internet. And then next, we can now create a data frame. So the function to create a data frame is called PD.data. And then the, the info that I want to convert to data frame. But first, we need to create some information. So let's assume that our information comes from the dictionary. Let's call, let's call it dict2, dictionary open close record. In pandas, right, the dictionary input into pandas has to be in column. So the first column is, let's say, I call this column number. And this column has a list uh, of four numbers. So this is the first key of the dictionary, the first value of the dictionary. Then the second would be, let's say, name. Then this is also a list of few names. So let's say I call it Abu, Ben, Charlie, Doug. So this. so this defines a new dictionary. And then I will define a new data frame, which I just call DF and convert that into a data frame. Data equals to dict2. Then show the F. So this is now a table with the number column. This is in this case actually not needed. On the left, 0, 1, 3 is an index. Again, Python starts counting from 0. And on the right is the name. So I can use actually the function describe to tell me what is in the data frame. So we have uh, four items, mean, standard deviation, and so on. So you can do these kind of things. And we can also ask you to tell us what are the data types in the data frame by using, sorry, uh, not this. So number is an integer, 64 bit. Name is an object. So that's it, simple. Data frame. And there are a lot of things that we can do in data frames. So I'm just going to show you what are they. So 
So I would say a data frame is the fifth kind of container that's quite useful because it allows you to create a table kind of uh, information. There's also a six call arrays, NumPy arrays, but we are not going to use it today. Okay, so the main function of using data frames is for data visualization. So when you want to truly see the data we use, the data frame is the best way to do it. So the, the library that we are going to use today is called Seaborn, which is quite simple, but has less customization. So there are two libraries in Python that you should use for visualization. The first is Seaborn. The second is called a Matplotlib. So Matplotlib actually is a, almost copied from MATLAB. The way that it plots graphs using in MATLAB is exactly the same way you, do, you use Matplotlib in Python, but it's quite complicated. So the easy way is to use Seaborn, right? And Seaborn can generate a lot of different plots. So there are quite a few plots at the bottom here. The first is what we call a line plot. So we are plotting the year and like how many apples or oranges that Canto province produces. The second is a scatter plot. So we plot two different continuous data. So this is for me for flower, the length and the width of this sepal in the flower. So it shows as a point. The next is a bar plot, or in this case, a histogram. So this is a histogram that shows uh, the frequency distribution for some flower data. The fourth year restaurant views is a bar plot. So it shows that basically a bar plot is a bar chart. And the fifth year, this where you have different colors is what we call a heat map. A heat map is used when you have a lot of different variables that you want to show at the same time. So you have month here. We have year. Then we have number of flights. So there are three, it's a 3D plot, but we don't want to draw in 3D. So we draw in 2D, but the color represents the third axis. So this is a heat map. It's quite good when we want to look at the multiple like high order data in just a simple drawing. Okay, so to move on, right, I'm going to ask you guys to upload uh, this uh, public data set called hondehalter.csv, which I'll just post in the chat here. Okay, so let me just upload this CSV file. So a CSV file can be generated from Excel. You just, if you have an Excel worksheet, you just click on file, save as uh, CSV file. And get it. So I'm just going to upload it here in the chat for you. So I hope everyone can download it. And I'm just going to show you how it looks like the actual file. Okay, so I'm just open this file. So if you know a bit of German, you will know what this file contains. But if not, I'm just going to show you here. So this is a public data set. That means that this is open source data that anyone can use. But for this demonstration, I have actually changed some of the data to make a bit more sense. So this is the, the file. You notice it looks exactly like Excel spreadsheet because it is an Excel spreadsheet. And then it has uh, some things here. Halter ID. Halter means owner, by the way. You have age, gender, district, quarter, breed, and so on. So if this were a real, uh, if this were a real data analytics workflow, right, I might have to do something to this data. For example, this age right, is a range. I might want to find out the real data. There are empty spaces here. I might need to fill in these empty spaces. These colors are in German language for some reason. Swatch means black, brown means brown. I might need to convert this data. And this is a process as we mentioned called uh, data cleaning and transformation or data wrangling or data managing or data remediation. 
right? So this is an example of like, some of the possible data that you can get in your life. And the data might not might be like a mess. It might be having different languages, uh, not properly, and so on. I'm going to upload a second version of this file, which is actually I have already helped you to clean up the whole data. And you can use it for the example. So I'm just going to open this clean version of this data. So this is a clean version of the data. I have eliminated some columns that are useless. I have changed the gender to male and female, the dog gender to male and female, dog age, color. We have only chosen the primary color uh, converted to English and so on. And I've limited the data to only 200 items, just as an example for today. So you can have a look and play with it if you want to. Okay, okay so I'm just going to show you how to upload your data onto the platform that I mentioned. The first will be Jupyter, right? So we upload the data by clicking on upload file on the left hand side of the screen, then you upload. Then you can choose the file you want to upload. So this is how you upload the file. If you are using Webflow, you drag the file directly to the left hand side of the screen. If you are using Webflow. If you are using Anaconda, uh, you don't have to actually do anything. You just have to create a notebook inside the file. So if you are using Anaconda, right, let me just show you how to do that in Anaconda, which is the most complicated way. So if you use Anaconda, the first thing you need to do is to open uh, Jupyter from your start menu. You run in the MS DOS screen, and then you open up your browser. And here you navigate to on the computer where you keep the file. So it actually opens up your uh, user folder on your C drive. So I've already opened it here. And this is where I kept the Hunter Hotter file. So I click on new on the right hand side, new notebook, item three. And then you open up a Jupyter notebook, which is actually exactly the same as the version that you see on the, uh, on the screen just now. Uh, this is running on your local computer. Right. So uh, I'm just going to continue with this, uh, just to show you guys more about this. Okay, so using the free and modified public data set, I would like to explore a few items. So let's start by importing the data. So you do that like, by import and dance as PD for obvious reasons. I can now create a data frame to keep the data. And I do that by, by typing PD dot read underscore CSV and then the file name. And let's print out the data frame. So it's quite big. Run the rows 13 columns. That's quite big data set here. So before I can import anything, I need to import the second library, which is Seaborn. And again, because I'm lazy to type in the name again and again, I use a short form, SP. It will take some time again because it's an external library. And then I can start plotting things that I want. So for example, uh, I want to plot, the first thing I put here is owner age. So I can do that by typing SP dot count plot equals to owner. Uh, it's just for each data equals to df. Wow, this is very colorful, a lot of edges. Let's try a second one, which is to do a histogram. This plot x equals to each data equals to df. Now that's much better. So, so Python and 
see bonds and help me to categorize the age into uh, sort of like bins. So I don't have to see everything. So let's spot something that has two variables. Let's spot the gender of owner versus age of block. And I'll use a box plot, see, a box plot. X is, X is a gender of owner. Y is the dot H. Data is from BF. Mm. So you can see not much difference between male and female in terms of the dog, the, the ages of their dogs that they like. And finally, let's try continuous data, scatter plot. Age of owner versus age of dog. Okay, x equals to age of owner, y equals to age of dog, dog age, data from BF. Mm. So you see that there seems to be a relationship right, between this uh, owner age and dog age. Maybe like we older owners have older dogs. So we are going to see how we can quantify this relationship in our next portion. Right. So if any issues like loading your files, right, let me know in the chat. Then maybe I can help you to uh, troubleshoot it. Otherwise, uh, I'll just go ahead. Okay, the final part for today is uh, machine learning in data analytics. So machine learning is something that you can speak for whole day, two days, three days, if you really want. But today I'm just going to give an overview and a simple example on how machine learning works. Huh? So machine learning involves building a model. First, you have to choose what, what model you have to train. Second, you train it. Then you test it. Then you validate. it. So testing and validating are different. Testing is like just test accuracy of the model. But well, the thing is to have a human look at the data and see is the model really doing what you expected to. So machine learning is used to find relationships or trends in data. So going back to our earlier discussion on data analytics, you want to find trends in data. So machine learning is one of the ways. There are three major types of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement. Reinforcement is quite rare. So I'm just not go through that. For supervised and unsupervised, supervised means I tell the ML, I tell the algorithm, this is the question, this is the answer. You find out the relationship. Unsupervised, this is all the questions, you find the answer yourself. So that's the simplest uh, explanation. So there are a lot of ML algorithms nowadays. But again, we look at the main titles, supervised, unsupervised. So in a supervised algorithm, we already know what the answer is. We have the question, we ask the ML to find out the relationship between the question and answer. For example, we can do regression. We have some data, X and Y, find relationship between X and Y. So maybe it turns out Y equals to X squared. That's called regression. So this is for continuous data. For data which are like text form, for example, gender and age, gender and income. We use the bottom ones. So we have decision tree, which is uh, asking the ML to find how to classify people by separating them into groups. Separating the group some more. So maybe you can separate this by gender. Then after male and female, so here maybe male, here maybe female, we can go into age. So maybe here is less than 30, more than 30. Ah, then we can classify the data this way. When the policy is a more complicated decision tree where all the classification is random. And we have other classification of algorithms such as K nearest neighbor or KNN. We have many different kinds of trees. Logistic regression, which is not a regression, but for it's a classification uh, algorithm. The main knife bias as we have these are more uh, complicated algorithms that I will not go into. And unsupervised algorithms are also like more complicated. So they are like k-means clustering where we find patterns, even though we don't know what the answer is, we are trying to find patterns. You can have a association Markov model. These are very advanced neural network models, which we surely won't use. 
most of our usage will be stuck in supervised in this column. So let's use this same data set that we just loaded. We want to find out the following insights. So there are three possible questions here that I want to find the answer to. The first is, does owner age co correlate with dog's age? So is it that like, older owners have older dogs? Does owner gender matter when choosing dog gender? Or does owner gender district and quarter? So we have multiple here. We have multiple inputs. But for second question, you only have one input. So let's try the easiest one, which is this. Does the owner age correlate with the age? So this is the easiest version here. For when it comes to machine learning. The common machine learning workflow will be import data, develop model. And before we start doing anything, we need to separate data into train and test. You should, the reason being that we don't want to test the data on the same model, on the same data that the model has already seen. So we are trained and test. Must be different from train set. We can have higher parameter tuning. This is optional and a more advanced concept. And finally, we validate the model and iterate if necessary. So we, we have to check the model ourselves and make sure that it's actually doing what we want. So in a linear regression, so later we are going to do linear regression of this uh, data set. It's the easiest machine learning model. And what a linear regression does is to plot the best fit line between the data. So this data, and this line in the center is the best fit line. And how I know how good the fit is, is by the, co the concept called coefficient or determination or R squared. R squared can be zero to one. If zero means the model is rubbish, and completely useless. One means the model fits perfectly. So if your R square is too low, you can try to request with a higher order model, maybe R, maybe X square, X cube, and so on. And that we call polynomial regression. But sometimes it can be too, it can be a mistake to use a too high order models when it comes to uh, doing regression. For example, I have this five data point here. This data point actually generated from a quadratic curve and then I we sort of like purposely adjusted the data a little bit so it looks like it's not a quadratic curve. Let's say I'm the data analyst I try to fit a model to this data I fit a linear model I get R squared equals to 0 0.09. This is very close to zero which means that this model is rubbish. So we call this as underfit. Uh, we call this model as underfit. Because the model is not complicated enough to capture the data's uh, trend. So next, okay, let's try x squared. So degree two is the x squared type of equation. I try to fit using this equation plus some other terms. I get r squared 0 0.77. So it looks good, but not perfect, right? So why don't I just try higher? I try degree three. I get r squared 0 0.1. Wow, that's better. I tried degree five, ask one perfect fit. But the question is, is this degree five really a perfect fit for the data? Because our original data is actually a quadratic fit, you know. But we try to fit too perfectly. We fit so much that actually like this, this uh, differences between this data is actually uh, maybe random error or measurement error. And then the model thinks that this is actually supposed to be part of the trend. So this is, what we call overfit. But overfit does not necessarily mean the R square will be one. Does not necessarily mean R square will be one. It's just in this specific case, this is an overfitting concept. R square equal to one, it means your model is just a perfect fit. Although whether there's an overfit or underfit will have to be determined by the user itself. All right? So, Let's go back to our example and let's try fitting a model to this. Okay, so if you know how to use MATLAB, right, and then you know how to do the regression in MATLAB, it takes a lot of steps and it is not user friendly at all. But in Python, the lead, a lot of these regression equations are pre-made for you. 
You just need to know where to import them. All right. So as I mentioned just now, the, the machine learning models are located in the SKLearn library. But in this case, uh, importing SKLearn will take a very long time because there are many machine learning models. So it's possible to just import certain parts of the, mod, uh, the, the library. So in this case, I will do this from SKLearn linear underscore model import linear regression. Because if I import the whole SKLearn, it will take a very long time. Do that and import the linear regression model for me. Then I create a new model, let's call it REG, which is a new linear regression model. So I have now set up my linear regression model. The model is empty, it knows nothing, but it's now set up in the uh, variable called IEG. So let's call, let's check the type. So this is this model is a variable type of sklearn.linear model dot base dot linear regression. Okay, so this model is ready. Let's take out the data that I want to uh, train it with. So let's check the data frame again. So in the data frame, right, we can, if I type in DF, it will show like the whole data frame as a uh, just seen here. I can show the first five columns by typing K. It just shows the first five columns. I want to, I want to find the relationship between this H and dot H. You have this graph again. I want to find the relationship between H and dot H. So what do I do? I take out the H and dot H as separate variables first. So my X is going to be H. So I do that by typing DF, double, so double square bracket, the name of the variable, Y, DF, double square bracket, dot H. In this case, a special case where you have to type in two layers of square records. Just, this is just a special case. So if I show X, this is a column. If I show Y, dot H, this is a column. Okay, so now I have two separate data frames that I have the data that I want to test on. So I just want to train X versus Y. So what do I do? I just type in the model name, dot feed, X, Y. That's it. Your model is trained. That's simple. But how do I know what is the result that have been obtained by the model? First, let's check the coefficient called R square. So we do that by calling the model dot score and then typing the two variables again. Let's print out R square. So R square here is 0 0.6705. Uh, as mentioned, the R square can be between 0 and 1. So 0 0.6705 means around 67%, which is average, so good, but not perfect. Then we can, we can call out the, uh, we can ask the model to predict the data that we want by typing RG. And let's install it in a variable called Y predict. Just to keep it somewhere. And let's show why predict. So the model output in a array, which is a six container third dimension. And now the last thing to do is to compare what we have just printed and the original data. So let's include this data into our original data frame. So access the column. Uh, let's call it dot h predict. And then put this data inside y predict. Okay, now check the data frame again. There should be a new there should be a new column at the end, which is the predicted h of the adult based on the owner's h. So I'm just uh, because data frame is mutable, I can ask it to change the column at this data. Frame. So add a new column, this data. And then I can start plotting the two plots. So I can do that with a scatter plot, sp dot scatter plot, x equals to h. 
y equals to log h, data equals vh. So this is original data. I will copy this, not the predicted ones. It looks like uh, this is a best fit line in the middle of this data. So let's plot both of these on the same axis so that you can uh, compare them directly. So we do that by three typing. Uh, plotting the first graph again by, use, by using the axis. So we need to specify the axis this time. So I'll just call the AX1 as axis. Plot this. AX2 equals to AX1 dot green axis. It's a specific like terms to use. You want to plot two graphs in the same plot. And then I'll just copy this over here. And maybe I just go in a line plot. So it looks different. Okay, so now I've gotten the same plot, the best fit line in the middle the original data, the predicted data, and I've gotten the R score, the R square score, which is 67% of uh, between zero and one. So this is basically a very simple machine learning model that we have just run. Right. So this is a really, really simple kind of machine learning model. We basically, we just want input data and one output data, right? So I'm just gonna stop sharing here. And we go back to our slides, our last slide for today. Okay, so that's the end of the demonstration for today about how Python can be used in data analytics by showing you how Python can do data visualization, machine learning, and so on. But if you're interested in know more about further resources, right? There are a lot of course, online free courses nowadays, like EAX, Coursera, Udemy, Udacity about Python, data analytics, and so on. And you can also learn Python by the python.org website, which is the official one. Usually when you have some trouble with your function, you go to here. You can have W3 schools, which is also a good place to learn Python. You have data cam. Data cam is more like a application wise. So if you want to do something specific, go to data cam, they'll tell you what to do. Finally, Stack Overflow is a good place to ask questions. So you, if you go to Stack Overflow, you'll find like a lot of questions from people, uh, like very specific questions, like how do I do exactly this? And then you can just copy your code and paste in your Python. Then you can get it done properly. So key takeaways from today, uh, welcome to Python. Uh, gentle learning curve. Python is a very easy programming language. So I show you in the past hour and about 15 minutes, how even a complete beginner can jump into Python. Master the basic elements. And one reason it's so easy is that there are a lot of Python libraries that you can just import and you can just use without programming the function yourself. Finally, that's all for today, but your Python journey begins uh, now. So don't wait and you can start learning Python anytime you want. So that's all for me uh, and I will pass it back to the MC. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Theo Weijian, for your insightful speech. After hearing all the sharing and thoughtful information, I bet all of us want to know more. So we will move on to a Q&A session from the audience that they would love to know more about. Now I would like to pass the floor to my partner, Shikai, to conduct the Q&A session. So Shikai, the place is yours. Thank you, Shamini. Thanks everyone, I'm Shikai, the moderator of the Q&A session. Before we proceed with the session, there is a request to all participants. Please ask questions only by typing the questions through the Mentimeter app by visiting the Mentimeter website with the entrance code as 95767583 or by clicking the link provided at the chat box. So, you are strictly not allowed to turn on your microphone for asking questions to avoid interruptions during the session. Now, let's see. Our first question is, can chemical engineers apply coding in the industry in Malaysia? Mr. Theo, perhaps you can answer this question first. Um, yes, the simple answer to this question is yes, you can apply coding in anywhere actually, any industry, not even chemical engineering. 
you can do it in finance, you can do it in accounting, you can do it in chemical engineering, and you can do it in even for very simple things like mass balance, energy balance, or even for tracking data, or analyzing plant data that you have, uh, you can apply coding based on the data analytics workflow that I just shown you. And that's how you apply uh, coding. So you can do use it for data cleaning, you can use it for data analysis, visualization, machine learning, and so on. So it's something that is starting to gain traction in Malaysia, but for now still limited mostly to the bigger companies. So if you are joining a very small company, don't expect too many people to know or be interested in coding. But for many big companies, uh, knowing coding is an advantage. Yeah, so that's my answer there. Right, thank you Mr. Tio for the answer. Now moving on to the next question. I'm currently self-learning Python programming, but I can't seem to be able to apply them easily. Is there any way that can allow me to understand it better and apply it? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Thanks. So there are a lot of places that you can learn Python. But the problem is that if you don't apply it frequently, you forget what you learned in one or two months. So if you are someone who is interested to go into the data science space, the best thing you can do is to start. Uh, you can try out with public data sets. There are a lot of public data available, such as this one, Kaggle which actually where I got the top and owner information from. And then I start getting insights from them and start making a portfolio of your skills. Second thing is to try to find out something in your current study or, work, or, or workplace that requires data analytics, but there's no existing solution. Use that as an example. Start training your data analytics skills from there. So it does take, like, you have to go and find out the opportunities for yourself if you're not working in this space. But you are, then there are a lot of opportunities that opens up to you. So that'll be my answer to that. I see. Thank you very much, Mr. Theo, for the answer. Now, moving on to the third question. Mm. Is the future all about programming and the world of data? Is it necessary for non-IT personnel to equip themselves with coding knowledge? Uh, yes and no, I would say. The future is about programming and more of data. It's yes, that is correct. Then there is more and more data nowadays. We are generating data every second. When you go on social media, you generate data. When you go to work, you generate data. When you buy something, you generate data. When you eat something, you generate data. When you go to a hospital, you generate data. So the future is the world of data. But is it necessary for non-IT personnel to create themselves with coding knowledge? The answer is not necessary. Depends on what you're doing. If you are a sales manager, I don't think you need coding. If you are, uh, if you are like a bus driver, you don't need, don't need coding. But knowing coding does open up new opportunities in the data science space, data analysts, consultants, which are, which is very hot right now, and they pay well as a, as a job, uh, opportunity. If you can get into that. But the problem with it paying well is also it's very competitive. So if you want to go into this kind of space, there's no better time to start now. So yeah, it's not necessary, but it will give you an advantage if you are trying to go for a career in uh, in the data science space. All right, thank you, Mr. Tio, for the insightful answer. Now, the moving on to the fourth question. Is it possible for us to work as an IT worker in the corporate despite having an engineering degree? Answer is yes, but don't limit yourself to IT. IT is just a department. There are other departments that need data science, data analytics, coding skills, not just IT. For example, in big companies like Shell, like Exxon, Automobile, Petronas, you can be a data science executive. You can even be a process analytics engineer. There's such a position where you use coding as a process engineer. So don't limit yourself to just IT. Not to mention that you have to compete with the IT people, the computer science graduates. So I think there's no reason to, to, to limit yourself as an IT worker. All right, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Tio, for the answer again. Yeah, thank you. And then bring us to the next question. 
is self-learning coding sufficient enough to become an expert and work for an industry in IT related fields in the future? The answer is yes, actually. But it does depend exactly on the company. Some company want you to get some certificates. Some company will accept online learning certificates. Um, it does depend on where you want. Or you want to be a freelancer, then nobody looks at your certificates. They only look at whether you can deliver the job or not. So it does depend exactly on which company you want. But the general answer will be yes, self learning is enough to be an expert. But whether then you apply whatever you learn in your class and not just memorize all the codes uh, and, and that's it. Right, thank you, Mr. Tio. And moving on to the last few questions that we have here. What specific areas of Python would you recommend for us as chemical engineers to focus on? If you are, if you are talking about study, usage of study, um, Python in your studies as a chemical engineering student, the best way to, the best place to focus on will be NumPy and SciPy. Because that's where you access all the mathematical functions, differentiation, integration, sine, cos, tangent, trigonometry, and so on. You might use that in your, you may use that equations in your life uh, as a student if you are doing that. And you may also use that when you are after you graduated and you become an engineer. So that's what you do. Uh, what you focus on if you are a chemical, very chemical engineering kind of engineer. If you are Moving into data analytics, the best is to uh, know how to use pandas, know how to use Seaborn Matplotlib, know how to use uh, scikit-learn, sklearn, and also learn some SQL because you might you might need it uh, to get data from databases. So it does depend on exactly which which focus are you in as a chemical engineer. All right, thank you, Mr. Theo. Now, uh, due to time constraint, we'll have our last questions for this Q&A session. So, what are the minimum requirements for a laptop or computer to run the Python program? Okay, first, Python is not a program. <laughs> Python is a language. So, the minimum requirements depend on the IDE you used to run Python. So, there's no, there's no minimum requirement for Python. But there are minimal requirements for the IDE that you use to run Python as a language. So for most IDEs, as long as you can run a browser, you can run Python. That's it. Especially those browser-based IDEs, as long as you have a browser, you can run Python. The difference will come in when you have a lot of data. For example, you have millions or millions of data points. You will need to have a computer with a fast processor, high RAM, and also a good graphic card because some Python, uh, some Python functions put on the graphic card in the GPU. So for normal usage, I would say as long as you can run a browser, your computer is fine to run Python. So that's my answer for that. But for uh, laptop-based Anaconda or, or PC-based local ID like Anaconda, you have to check the system requirements on the Anaconda website. Right. Thank you, Mr. Theo, for the insightful answers. And that's all for the Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this session. And I'll pass the room back to Shamimi. Thank you.